Almost every person I know describes the book of Proverbs as a long list of one-verse Proverbs that are all mixed up and without an apparent theme. Many Christians attempting to read through the Bible in a year get to Proverbs and end up reading a chapter in a single sitting, about 10 minutes or less. This allows very little time for reflection and gains little understanding beyond the primary principle, if even that. The average reader fails to stop and savor each proverb like a bite of tasty food for a hungry man. Think how he would appreciate the warmth of the food, the taste that first impresses the tongue and then changes as it is slowly chewed, the joy of swallowing and eventually satisfying the hunger pains. Think of the contentedness of completing a sumptuous meal. No proverb should be read quickly and then passed over. Each proverb should be enjoyed as a tasty, satisfying wisdom banquet in and of itself. Time should be taken to examine its structure, topic, sentence development, word play, and layers of meaning. I believe much thought was given to the development of each short statement. The impact and lasting impression of the proverb's lesson depends upon the witty positioning and selection of its words. Patiently studying, reflecting, and savoring each proverb is the only way a student of wisdom will be able to internalize multiple levels of wisdom hidden within. I would argue that anyone who reads a chapter of Proverbs at a time has probably failed to uncover the rich teaching hidden within each proverb. In our last session, we briefly covered the different kinds of Proverbs. In this lesson, I would like to begin digging deeper into the structure, vocabulary, wordplay, and design of the synonymous and antithetic proverbs. I would emphasize that the structure of these proverbs lend insight to its teaching almost as much as the content does. Let's begin with the synonymous proverb. Synonymous comes from two Greek words meaning same and name. This gives us a modern definition of having the same or similar meaning. In literature, synonymous reflects the intentional association of two or more words for the purpose of highlighting their relationship. This pairing is intended to underscore the connection between the words by association or similar meaning and at the same time draw out the slight distinctions or shades of meaning. Thus, the two lines of a synonymous proverb intentionally express the same thought or teaching, but the carefully chosen synonymous words expand description, sharpen distinctions, and describe truth from slightly different angles to promote greater insight and understanding. This becomes an excellent teaching technique in Proverbs for revealing a principle. Let me use an easy illustration of color. I could say I saw a friend wearing a red shirt, but that may not help you understand exactly what shade of red I saw. Any person familiar with color charts at a paint store will know quickly that there are many shades of red. Stores sell tomato red, cherry red, brick red, fire engine red, rose red, scarlet, crimson, and burgundy red. To describe the color of my friend's shirt as red only gives me a color range. It does not pinpoint the exact shade of red it was. To describe the red as crimson connects the two words together, clarifying the shade of red I saw. Decorators, painters, artists, printers, fashion designers, and many other professionals depend upon the ability to describe exactly the color they want. Synonymous proverbs, by their relational structure, compare similar words with slight differences to cultivate, like colors, different shades of meaning. According to my calculations, there are 54 synonymous proverbs in the book of Proverbs. That's about 9% of the 530 proverbs in the book. Of these, 75% of them are found in chapters 16 to 22. Only two are found in the first 13 chapters or the last two chapters of Proverbs. Let's look briefly at a few of these synonymous Proverbs to illustrate their technique. Let's return to a proverb we used in the last session. It says, 
A wicked man listens to evil lips. A liar pays attention to a malicious tongue. Notice first the similar meaning of both lines of the proverb. Wicked man, in line one, is synonymous with the liar. Listens to, of line one, coincides with, pays attention to, in line two. And evil lips, in the first line, corresponds with malicious tongue, in line two. After the structure, let's examine the proverb's meaning. A common theme in Proverbs illustrates how the words of a wicked man or liar are destructive. The wicked man is usually characterized as one who speaks out of anger, without self-control, gives away secrets, betrays a confidence, gossips, backbites, tears down, ridicules, and talks arrogantly. He has little concern for the feelings of others and does not care how his words will wound and hurt. He's more interested in speaking his mind and expressing himself. Since Proverbs stresses community and living in harmony with others, the words of the wicked illustrate a potentially destructive force. Wicked speech is thus condemned and avoided. This proverb is slightly different than others containing speech as a theme. Instead of the wicked man or liar being the one who speaks, in this proverb, the wicked man is one who listens to evil speech. In other words, this proverb is teaching a profound principle. He who listens to, accepts, and believes wicked words becomes a wicked person. If we walk with those who speak arrogantly, boastfully, or cursing, it will be difficult not to begin speaking like them. 1 Corinthians 15.33 gives us a similar principle. It says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Instead of the phrase, we are what we eat, or we are what we think, this proverb teaches, we become what we hear. Let's do a personal test. What do you listen to? What kind of radio show or music do you hear? Have you stopped to think about the lyrics of your favorite songs? Are your friends with people who gossip, curse, or tell crude jokes? Do you enjoy that kind of speech? Or do you simply keep quiet in order to avoid angering a friend? When someone shares with you a bad thing someone else has done, are you quick to believe it? Do you become angry at that reported person? If so, then you should study this proverb and put it into practice. Another synonymous proverb is found in chapter 17, verse 20. It says, A man of perverse heart does not prosper. He whose tongue is deceitful falls into trouble. A man of perverse heart in the first line is paired with he whose tongue is deceitful in the second. Also, does not prosper in the first line is paired with falls into trouble in the second line. At first, it seems that perverse heart and deceitful tongue can't be synonymous. Let me make two observations about this proverb that come from the Hebrew school of wisdom. First is the pairing of heart and tongue together in the two lines. Heart stands for what is within us, what fills our inner being, what we think and dream about. The tongue stands for our speech and what we say to others. By pairing them together, this proverb teaches our heart and tongue refer to what we reflect on and then say. In Luke chapter 6, verse 45, Jesus illustrates the connection of heart and mouth when he says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. If we allow anger, hatred, pride, deceit, corruption, malice, gossip, and many other evil things to fill our heart, making it perverse, then when we speak, our words will reflect what is in our heart. A second observation comes from the word perverse. In Hebrew, it literally means crooked or not straightforward. Consider this. If a person does not go in a straight line toward his goal, he may never be able to reach it. Putting the two lines together, a more comprehensive meaning becomes clear. One who fills his heart with perverted things will not be able to go forward in a straight manner or reach his goal. Thus, he will not prosper. The same is true of one who speaks deceitfully to others. 
Such a habit may fool some once or twice, but eventually such behavior will only bring trouble. People with deceitful tongues have few friends. Another synonymous proverb comes from chapter 18, verse 19, and says, An offended brother is more unyielding than a fortified city, and disputes are like the barred gates of a citadel. The Hebrews, as well as most cultures, placed high value on family, brotherly love, and loyalty. Such a close relationship is precious because it provides a sense of joy, companionship, an opportunity to share ideas and dreams, learn from each other, and receive help in times of difficulty. But there is also a realization that when such a deep love and friendship is offended or hurt, it can be the source of great bitterness and long-lasting conflict. In this proverb, an offended brother is compared to a fortified city with walls and gates that deny access. Emphasis on the broken relationship and lack of openness is underscored with the words unyielding in the first line and barred gates in the second. I think we have all suffered at times when a friendship or relationship is deeply hurt or even broken. Communication breaks down and the offended person will distance himself from the offender. Notice in this proverb that the cutting off of relationship and denied access is intensified in the second line when the fortified city is further described as a citadel. A citadel is the upper part of a fortified city, the most difficult place to penetrate. This proverb makes an important observation about what happens when very close friendships go wrong. It observes that the very source of great happiness can become the source of great bitterness and hurt, and that emotional walls are put up, resulting in alienation and denied access. The unspoken corollary teaching of this proverb is the extreme importance to nurture, cultivate, and protect friendships so that they do not become a source of great hurt. Protecting our friendships is a sign of wisdom. The final synonymous proverb that we shall study in this lesson is found in chapter 21, verse 17. There it says, He who loves pleasure will become poor. Whoever loves wine and oil will never be rich. Notice the parallel meanings in both lines. He who loves pleasure in line one coincides with whoever loves wine and oil in line two. Become poor at the end of line one is synonymous with never be rich in line two. The obvious meaning of this proverb is that those who use their riches simply for enjoyment will become poor. But there are layers of meaning to this proverb that Hebrew students would quickly understand. According to Proverbs, wealth and riches do not come to the lazy, idle, or pleasure-seeking people. Wealth and riches come to the diligent and hardworking. Though the principle is found throughout the Bible, let me stay in Proverbs to make this point. Chapter 10, verse 4 says, Lazy hands make a man poor, but diligent hands bring wealth. Being diligent or lazy also affects our position in society. The proverb in chapter 12, verse 24 says, Diligent hands will rule, but laziness ends in slave labor. For the Hebrew mind, wine and oil represents banquets and feasts. Wine is sometimes used as a sign of joy and celebration. So is it wrong to celebrate with wine and oil? Is it wrong to love wine or oil? The meaning of the proverb is more subtle than just the praise of those who are diligent or hardworking. The proverb is emphasizing those who primarily seek pleasure and enjoyment from their wealth. Those who seek pleasure in excess instead of using their time and resources to provide for their family, help the poor, and care for the needy. These, the proverb says, will not keep their riches or obtain the happiness they seek. In Proverbs, wealth and riches are a gift from God given only to those who, by hard work, practice the godliness emphasized in true faith. Also, Proverbs would argue that true happiness is not found in seeking personal pleasure with one's riches, but in using personal riches to help others find joy and happiness. These upside-down principles escape the foolish and are only understood by the wise.
Synonymous words are an important way of teaching in Proverbs. Identifying a cluster of words that describe a person, a characteristic, or result is necessary to understand the breadth and width and height and depth of a particular concept. As we study Proverbs, it will be very important to recognize the book's synonymous vocabulary. Proverbs does not use just one word for a wise man. He is also called righteous, upright, prudent, industrious, generous, discerning, disciplined, impartial, fair, a good neighbor, and God-fearing. The foolish person is also called wicked, lazy, loud, a brawler, a thief, a false witness, a troublemaker, a scoffer, a mocker, and disobedient to God. The fate of each is also described in many words. For example, the wise man shall be rich, successful, fruitful, secure, honored, live a long life, enjoy a good reputation, be at peace with others, walk uprightly and blamelessly, and enjoy God's blessings. The fool's destiny is punishment, beatings, poverty, shame, ruin, disaster, utter destruction, and alienation from God. All of these synonymous word clusters produce composite pictures of what Proverbs wants us to understand about being wise or foolish. Synonymous Proverbs use this composite picture technique to teach its important life principles. Let's move from synonymous to antithetic proverbs. Antithetic comes from a Greek word meaning to oppose or contrast in order to see. Antithetic proverbs place people, their character, their actions, or their end results in opposition to each other. This contrast is intended to help the student see the difference between the two in order to make a wise evaluation or judgment. Antithetic proverbs are by far the most common proverb found in the book of Proverbs. By my count, there are 211 antithetic proverbs. That constitutes 38% of all the proverbs in the book. While no antithetic proverb exists in chapters 1 to 9 or in chapters 30 and 31, 149 of them, or 70%, are found in chapters 10 to 15. They dominate the first six chapters of Solomon's Proverbs in this second literary unit. Structurally, antithetic Proverbs will contrast the first line with the second. Where Hebrew scholars might draw two parallel lines to illustrate a synonymous proverb, they would cross the lines forming an X to illustrate a contrasting or opposing nature. This cross closely resembles the key letter of the Greek alphabet. As a result, many Bible scholars call this literary technique a chiastic structure. It is the dominant structural form of antithetic proverbs. Let me illustrate this chiastic structure with a few proverbs. Let's begin with chapter 14, verse 5, which says, A truthful witness does not deceive, but a false witness pours out lies. This antithetic proverb contrasts the truthful witness and his actions in line 1 with the false witness in line 2. God in the Old Testament speaks often about social justice, and His prophets cried loudly against the oppressive and corrupt practices of wicked officials. It is not surprising, then, that some of the Proverbs would give instruction about how to conduct oneself within the legal system. At first reading, this proverb seems right and straightforward. A truthful witness does not deceive, a false witness pours out lies. This is where the reader, flying over the chapter, would agree and pass on. But there's a twist to this proverb. If two witnesses stand up and give opposing testimony, how do we know whose legal testimony to believe? How do we know which one is telling the truth and which one is lying? And when we encounter opposing stories in daily life, how can we know whose testimony to believe? There will be many times where we are called upon to decide between two differing accounts. Both witnesses appear sincere. And if we did not see what happened, then how do we know who is the false witness and who is the truthful witness? 
That makes this proverb more difficult to understand. But notice this proverb does not focus only on the testimonies. It also describes the witnesses. Knowing how to assess opposing testimonies and the witnesses is an important discipline for proverbs. In fact, it is an important mark of a wise person. Embedded in this proverb is an important principle for making a decision on whose testimony to believe. It suggests we examine the character of the witness together with their testimony. What do these witnesses normally do? Is one lazy man and another hardworking? Is one a good citizen within the community and another a known thief? Is one a respected leader and another a troublemaker? Is one known to be a liar and the other to speak the truth? When it is difficult to judge between differing testimonies and the stories seem equal, then look beyond what is said and examine the character and integrity of the witnesses. Add into your decision the personal history, reputations, speech patterns, family, and known behavior of the witnesses. Be careful not to weigh and measure only the words of the witness. Examine also the people giving testimony. This will increase a wise person's chances of selecting the right testimony and avoid supporting the wrong witness. Among the antithetic proverbs, there is an interesting feature that often appears within the chiastic structure. Sometimes a common element is shared by both lines of the proverb. Often the opposing people or characteristics react differently to it, thus gaining differing results. This common element can be placed where the two lines of the proverbs cross each other, for it is there that the two lines share something. Let me illustrate this idea with a few proverbs. In chapter 13, verse 13, the antithetic proverb says, He who scorns instruction will pay for it, but he who respects a command is rewarded. He who scorns in the first line is opposed to or contrasted by he who respects in line two, and will pay for it of line one is contrasted with is rewarded in the second line. The opposing characteristics or actions and the results respond to a common factor, instruction or a command. This instruction sits where the lines meet or at the nexus of the chiastic structure. Let's begin a closer inspection of this proverb by first examining the meaning of the word command. Many scholars believe command does not refer to the commandments of God, but rather the teachings of the wise, parental instruction, worldly laws, or the principles gained from life experiences. However, there may not be a need to choose between the two meanings. Spiritual commands and worldly instruction in Proverbs are connected so that whenever a person obeys them, he will benefit, but when he neglects them, he suffers. Returning to the proverb, notice the words scorn and respect. They suggest not only rejection or compliance of instruction, but an important internal attitude that separates the wise from the foolish. The foolish man arrogantly thinks he knows best and resists instruction from others. He will ridicule counsel and refuse to consider it. The wise man's attitude understands why a command is given, and he sees the benefit in following it. Therefore, the wise follows the command not because of a fear of punishment for disobeying it, but because he sees the good that can come from submitting to it. The contrasting result between those who accept instruction and those who do not is also significant. By scorning instruction, one will pay for it. This means they will suffer for it. It could mean physical punishment, such as beatings or imprisonment. It may include having to endure some kind of emotional punishment, such as fear, shame, or feelings of guilt. Or it could mean some social punishment that comes from broken relationships. However, by using the word pay, there is also a hint of financial punishment, perhaps in the form of fines and penalties. This seems to fit better with the idea that the wise man, by respecting a command, is rewarded. The principle of riches and reward for the wise man and poverty and ruin for the foolish is an oft-repeated teaching in Proverbs. The wise man lives in such a way as to avoid fines and penalties. 
He protects his wealth by obeying the laws and living in a peaceful way within his community. The foolish man is forced to pay for his misbehavior. Therefore, respecting or scorning instruction and commands ties into the composite picture in Proverbs and explains one aspect of why the wise are rich and the foolish are poor. Let me give one more antithetic proverb for this lesson. In chapter 13, verse 9, it says, The light of the righteous shines brightly, but the lamp of the wicked is snuffed out. The righteous in the first line is contrasted to the wicked in the second line. Shines brightly of line 1 is contrasted with snuffed out in line 2. And the light and its corresponding lamp provide the shared element between the two lines. It sits where the lines cross. For Proverbs in much of the Old Testament, light is a key symbol, representing life with all its levels of meaning. Light also represents goodness, holiness, purity, godly living, knowledge, and an ability to discern. Darkness represents evil, wickedness, ignorance, and an ability to know what is around you. Light represents blessings. Darkness represents punishment. There are two things that stand out about this proverb that I'd like to share. First, let's note that both the righteous and the wicked have a source of light. But the light of the wicked is a lamp which is man-made, artificial, needs fuel, and can be put out. What is the light of the righteous? Is it also a lamp? Does this light have a physical source? The proverb doesn't say. Or does it? Consider the words of Jesus to his disciples in Matthew 5, verses 14 and 16. He says, You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The student of wisdom literature would understand that God, who is the source of light, shines through his faithful people. Their righteousness becomes a shining example to unbelievers, those who are in the darkness. Though a light source is the common element between the two lines, this proverb recognizes a different source of light for the wicked and righteous. A physical light comes from the lamp of the wicked. A spiritual light comes from the godly lives lived out in front of unbelievers. A righteous person does not need kerosene or wicks for his lamp. He shines because of his faithful obedience to God, his righteousness. Let me add one more note about this proverb. For a time, both the wicked and the righteous may shine a light in the darkness of the world. However, notice the phrase, snuffed out. The lamp of the wicked will be put out, leaving them in darkness. And the question for the student of wisdom is, who puts out their lamp? It is God. And that should be a great concern for the wicked and a wonderful assurance for the righteous. I hope you've enjoyed digging a little deeper into the structures of synonymous and antithetic proverbs. And I hope you've gained some tools and techniques to pull out the multiple layers of the teaching that each proverb contains. Please join me in the next lesson as we look at synthetic and better proverbs. Until next time.